Good morning and welcome. We are pleased that so many of our alumni could join us today, join with our HEP steering committee for this most important community program. The purpose of our time together is to provide you with an update of our HEP research and to offer you an opportunity to express your interest, hopes and priorities for our shared commitment to this important work, our history and its legacy in the lives of our alumni and in the education of our students today. As head of school, I am honored to serve as the chair of the HEP steering committee. I have one technology note, housekeeping note before we begin. Today's chat feature will be used to capture responses to questions our facilitators pose to the group. We'll give direction when it's ready to shift the group to a discussion so you can know when to drop your questions in the chat. The chat will also be recorded so that we can be sure to capture your feedback and bring it forward in our work. When we gather as a community for a reunion weekend, it is a time of celebration and cheer. But today's discussion calls us to a different place, a sacred place where we listen, we pray, and we open our hearts to a story of a painful history, a story of enslavement. In September of 2016, the History of Enslaved People Project, HEP, was conceived with a commitment to openness and transparency and a desire to learn, reflect, and teach. We are called to investigate, to explore, and to acknowledge the reality of a most sorrowful past. If we as a community of faith can humbly accept that acts of racism, oppression, and injustice sinfully fail to recognize the human dignity of the person, then we must also recognize our responsibility to tell the story of those who labored on this campus and contributed to the success of our school, not by choice, but as enslaved men, women, and children. If we as a community of faith understand our inherent responsibility, we will know that we are called to take what we have heard, what we have seen, and what we now know, and to respond to the present, endeavoring to make visitation a place of belonging for all. As educators, we are called to nurture the hearts and minds of our students and to model and to empower the conviction to confront injustice and to use our intellect to imagine solutions to the most challenging problems and inequities. We are a school with a history of enslavement. It is part of a long complicated story in studying our history of enslavement, we have the opportunity to learn from this history, to honor the lessons of this history, and of all the people who contributed to the success of this institution, some not of their choosing, but through the sin of slavery, and to incorporate the fullness of this history into both our formal and informal curriculum. In a recent article entitled, Knowing each other's history is vital in fighting racism and healing America. Cardinal Wilton Gregory, Archbishop of Washington, underscored the importance of acknowledging and wrestling with our history. He reminds us that the more that we know about our history, the less likely we are to repeat its failures. That racism is only able to survive as long as there is ignorance, racism grows in the soil of ignorance. That racial healing is an aspiration that will only be possible because of the ceaseless attention of people of goodwill who believe in the value and the significance of living harmoniously in a multiracial, racial, multicultural world. We are people of goodwill. And I pray that each of us sees through the eyes of Christ and always chooses to love. I would like to share with you a prayer. 
It was written by the former head of school, Dan Kearns, and was first read at the 2018 Founders Day celebration. It is the prayer that opens each HEP steering committee meeting. God in heaven, we acknowledge and remember those who were enslaved on this campus, those who contributed to the growth and success of our school, not by their choice, but by the evil, but through the evil of slavery. They are women, men, and children who to this point have been anonymous, faceless, and nameless. We have deprived them of their name and their dignity. And for this, we beg forgiveness. We now remember them with the respect that they are due. We ask for forgiveness for our part in the cultural sins of slavery and for the way that it was lived out in our early community here at Georgetown Visitation. We apologize for the lack of moral courage in addressing these transgressions. But God, we are an Easter people committed to hope. We pray that we can also be a people committed to change. Inspire us to see each and every person we meet as our equal and as a child of God. Accept our prayers of contrition for the failures of the past and reinforce in us the desire and the need to live out our discipleship as women and men of faith, vision, and purpose as we create a world of justice, compassion, and lasting peace. We ask for these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Olivia Wills Kane, Director of the St. Jane de Chantal Salesian Center, to share the highlights of our work. Good morning. Four years ago, during a History of Enslaved People Steering Committee workshop, we identified three values as a Catholic Salesian school to guide the sacred work. Honesty, humility, and humanity. Your presence here this morning is a witness, I hope, that you too are committed to these same values and to the shared responsibility of every Georgetown Visitation alumna to learn our history, to remember our history, and to Liz live as disciples of the gospel in response to the legacy of this history. There are few topics as difficult to talk about as slavery. Over the last five years, since the St. James de Chanel Salesian Center was tasked with stewarding research into our history of enslavement, I have become more educated about the content, yet I have never become more comfortable talking about the reality that the Sisters of the Visitation enslaved other human beings. And in a way, I'm grateful for the constant discomfort that the truth of our history causes me because it brings me to prayer again and again. It motivates me to do this work and it reminds me daily that I can never dare to forget that this is not a professional assignment, but a moral responsibility I have to my brothers and sisters in Christ who were enslaved. Even though I know it's what I'm called to do, it's still difficult and it's humbling. Personally, it's humbling for me as a white woman. It's humbling for me as a Catholic woman. And it's humbling for me as a visitation alumna and administrator, having received both a diploma and a paycheck from a school that benefited from institutional slavery. Those are a few pieces of my story. And I know each of you have your own stories that shape how you hear and talk about, or perhaps choose not to talk about, visitation in our nation's history of enslavement. While I can't know what you bring to today's conversation, please know that I strive to be sensitive and respectful about sharing our history so that each of you can have a fuller understanding of the place and the people who are a part of your story as visitation women. Silhouetted here are nine of the people whom over the past five years, I have come to know as brothers and sisters. They are the Tillman family. 
In the summer of 2020, the Salesian Center commissioned silhouetted portraits of the 13 people enslaved by the convent for whom we have some biographical or physical details. It is one small way that we have been striving to restore humanity to a few of the individuals whose freedom, identity, and dignity was taken through enslavement. In addition to the Tillman family, silhouettes of three men, Benjamin Mahoney, Joseph Dixon, and Thomas Weldon were also created. We have begun to bring these silhouettes into our teaching on our history, and I share this image today so that we too are reminded of the humanity of the people about whom I speak. That enslaved people labored on Visitation's campus appears in actually both of our published histories. Documentary evidence supports this fact, but it had been little studied until recently when our country's national story has changed to include slavery as a larger part of its narrative. Historic sites such as Monticello and universities such as Georgetown have more visibly acknowledged their historical ties to slavery, expanding their own research and programming. This complicates traditional narratives at these institutions and at ours, but it also enriches them. These and other initiatives show that by incorporating new evidence into our understanding, it leads to the formulation of new interpretations, and that can help prompt reconciliation and reparation with previously held knowledge. Today, I highlight just a few important details and themes from our research into our history of enslavement, which is ongoing. For 63 years of our 223 year history, between 1800 and 1862, the Sisters of the Visitation enslaved men, women, and children. On April 16, 1862, the last people enslaved by the convent were emancipated when the federal government abolished slavery in the District of Columbia. While the popular portrayal of slavery in the United States is enslaved people laboring in fields on a large plantation, slavery manifested itself at Georgetown Visitation in a different way. Here, religious women who had taken vows of poverty collectively owned enslaved people in an urban context. To date, 121 people have been identified, either by name or by brief description in documentary evidence as having been inherited, bought, sold, hired out, hired in, manumitted, or emancipated by Georgetown Visitation Convent, mother superiors, nuns, or chaplains. The number of people enslaved on campus at any one time varied. For example, the 1840 census counted only three people, but in 1845 or possibly 1841, a large inheritance brought at least eight and possibly as many as 11 enslaved people to campus. Many of those enslaved by the sisters were brought here by women joining the convent. While some of the enslaved people labored on our campus, others were hired out or sold to underwrite the continued operation of the school and construction of buildings. Among these individuals, some were donated to the convent, yet never set foot on campus. Others were born into enslavement at visitation. Some, including the Tillman family, have been traced to years after emancipation. Others, however, are only a brief count on a census record. Some of the buildings where we teach and work and pray today were likely built with enslaved labor, including the chapel. The stories we have learned are as varied as the people described. For example, one instance is found that three students brought their quote servant with them, which may have supplemented their tuition payment. There were a dozen instances of enslaved people who were making payments towards buying their freedom. 
Some of them were, quote, hiring in that is doing extra work on campus to earn money as payment for their freedom. The convent bought a woman, Anne Green, and simultaneously enabled her to buy her freedom. And also there was found an agreement for Stephen Dixon and his wife, Anne, who were together purchasing their liberty for $500. The contract stipulates, however, that they could not buy the freedom of their children, Joseph and his sister, an unnamed, quote, little girl. Joseph Dixon, who would have been 11 years old at the time, remained enslaved by the convent until he was freed by the federal government in 1862. Some aspects of the enslaved experience at Georgetown Visitation are manifested in the details we have learned about one family, the Tillman family I've mentioned silhouetted here. Ignatius Tillman, along with his wife, Susan, was taken to visitation in 1841 or 1845. Susan Tillman, sometimes called by her baptismal names, Mary Elizabeth, was 41 years old at emancipation and described by the convent as, quote, a very intelligent, stout, active woman who is perfectly healthy, unquote. After her emancipation, she worked as a nurse, as a servant and as a cook, and sometimes stayed home to care for the family. She learned to read and write between 1870 and 1900 and might have died between 1900 and 1902. Susan and Ignatius Tillman were married for at least 55 years and all their children were born at visitation. Rosalie, their youngest child, was only six months old when she was freed. During their enslavement, Ignatius and Susan had signed an agreement with the convent to buy their freedom and had made some payments toward that. After they were freed by the federal government in 1862, they asked the government to pay them what they had paid to the convent towards their freedom. It is unclear whether they ever recouped their money. Ignatius Tillman was 40 years old at his 1862 emancipation and is described by the convent as, quote, smart and healthy, end quote. After emancipation, he lived in Washington, D.C., working as a laborer, as noted in the Civil War draft document. He also worked as a gardener and a porter in the district for 22 years, eventually moving by 1897 to Philadelphia where he worked as a plasterer and gardener. He can be traced to 1902 at age 79. He never learned to read or write. Stories like these of the Tillman family have been woven together with additional insights from research of documentary evidence in our History of Enslaved People Project Research Report. The report and all supporting documents can be found on our website. Our report and our sharing today are offered as signs of our commitment to honesty and humility in learning, remembering, and responding to our history. As we now say to our students on each October Founders Day and on each April DC Emancipation Day, and as I now say to my fellow alumni each reunion weekend, we remember, we choose to remember We choose to remember because we can't afford to forget. I am grateful to each of you for your engagement and partnership in this sacred work and ask you to continue to keep us in prayer. I now invite Dr. Edmondson to share where we are today on our journey. Thank you, Olivia. This is our journey and we remain committed to continuing this research and making public any research findings that we uncover along the way. This year as a priority, we committed to creating a curriculum, a scope and sequence so that we could teach our students this history and its lasting impact in the present day. When we started this work, it was our intention to spend the year building out a scope and sequence to teach this legacy across all grade levels and subjects. As we move through this work, going deeper and engaging more people whose experience, identity, and lenses 
we needed represented in this work, we realized the complexity of our mission. We didn't want to pull back, but we realized in order to be thoughtful and impactful that we needed to move thoughtfully and a little slower. So we've broken it down into pieces and we are committed to developing a curriculum map for our freshmen, the class of 2026. It will be implemented this fall, fall 2022. We will continue to work our way up through the grades so that all students have the opportunity to learn about the history of enslavement and understand their role in, in, in making the world a more just place. We engage three groups in this work, our faculty, our students, and our alumni. The faculty and staff became the HEP Curriculum Scope and Sequence Committee. Their mission was to incorporate the following content into the, into the school's existing curriculum. One, the history of enslaved people at visitation. Two, contextualize visitation's history of enslavement into the broader US history and our world history. And three, that they may understand diverse perspectives, social justice work that is informed by our Catholic faith and our Salesian charism. Our student advisory group provided student perspective on the work of the faculty committee. The student group is also developing a set of dialogue norms for use in the classrooms to accompany this content. And then our alumni advisory group. In September, we established this group of 12 alums spanning four decades with professional backgrounds in education, curriculum, training, and teaching to provide an alum perspective to help inform this work. We've met with this group throughout the year. They've offered insights, suggested reading across the, across the disciplines and have shared reactions to draft ideas from the faculty and staff committee. We are committed to the development of a more inclusive curricular experience that teaches our enslavement history while helping students to explore their own identities and their responsibilities in relation to the visitation community and the greater global community. As a secondary school, the most significant impact that we can have is to teach and to form discerning young women who have the capability and the commitment to posit positively impact the world so that they might understand what it truly means to be a woman of faith, vision, and purpose. To assist us with this ongoing learning, reflection, and activities in and out of the classroom, we engage two consultants, Daniel Harrison and Kristen Gallus, to help us clarify our specific goals and to create actionable plans. Danielle and Kristen, bring distinct and complementary experience, skills, and commitment to this work. And we are confident that they will help to bring clarity and action aligned with our faith and charism to our work. I describe these two women as our head and our heart. Danielle Harrison is the energy behind her consulting ministry, uniting mission, faith, and equity. Danielle formerly served as the co-director of the Jesuit Slavery, History, Memory, and Reconciliation Project. Many of us know Danielle as the former director of Mission Integration at Visitation Academy in St. Louis, and having served as a member of the Visitation School Network Assessment Visiting Team for Georgetown Visitation. Kristen Gallus brings incredible expertise in the interpretation of slavery. She concentrates most of her work engagement in museum education. She is an educator and an author who has introduced Georgetown Visitation, well, who was introduced to Georgetown Visitation when she first facilitated a two-day workshop with the HEP Steering Committee in January 2018 and returned to visitation this past fall again for engagement with our students, faculty, and staff. She recently published Interpreting Slavery with Children and Teens. As a project stewarded by the Salesian Center, 
Olivia Kane acts as the liaison between the school and our consultants. Both women work closely with our steering committee and are present to the community as both educators and formers. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to these two inspiring women, Danielle Harrison and Kristen Gallus, who will engage you in conversation regarding our history and our work. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, and I'm so grateful to be here uh, with you this morning. I like to start with the story um, as why this work is so personal to me. As Barbara said, I am a, um, I used to work at Visitation Academy in St. Louis, but even more than that, I was formed by the Sisters of the Visitation in St. Louis. Uh, I am a 1983 graduate of the, that school, and I went to school there from first to 12th grade. So lifer or charter member, the visitation spirit and the visitation charism has guided me in all of the work that I do um, even up to today. So this is important to me, not just as professionally, but personally. And I remember about four years or five years ago, I was on um, visitation Georgetown campus standing by what was called for a long time the slave cabin, but now we know as the dairy cabin. And I remember standing there uh, and feeling like it was a kind of a come full circle moment that here I was a black woman being charged to carry the charism and mission of the sisters of the visitation as their numbers uh, diminish. But yet as a black woman, um, had I been here 200 years prior, I would be maybe working in this dairy cabin. And I could hear the voices of my um, ancestors saying to me, please make our contribution known. Please make us known as people who contributed, who carried the charism, who contributed to the power of the visitation again, the Georgetown visitation. So I am, I am honored to be um, to doing the work and I consider it very um, important and impactful that we look at it. Especially if we look at what's happening in today's world, if we look at the political climate and the, um, the, the climate outside, it kind of, there's a lot of fear going on around this as we go into work, um, especially around um, looking at the effects, the negative effects of racism on this country. And there's a lot of fear. And because of that, there's a lot of things that are changing. You have a lot of different kind of um, political agendas that are being pushed. That's why it's so very important that we as an institution understand that we don't do this because, um, because it's the politically correct thing to do right now. Our charism, our mission has always led us to this work. If we see that, um, you know, Francis says that, that human dignity is important and that we should understand that we're all made in the image and likeness of God and that we are all made good. It is, it is unfortunate that we didn't, we didn't live that way for a long time. And so now we are kind of reckoning with that. So if we can in, in, infuse the language of our charism, of our mission, of our faith to, to dictate to us why we do this work, um, then there's no political agenda in, involved. It's really about this is what God has called us to do. So we do this because, um, because the scripture says, um, that we're all made in the image and likeness of God. We do this because the scripture says, to whom much is given, much is required. We do this because Francis says, when we talk about our little virtues, we talk about um, the caring, as Olivia said earlier, humility, humanity, justice. We talk about this work because it is important for us to recognize the giftedness of each person who walked through 
our doors, whether uh, they felt they were welcomed or even when they were not welcomed or they were forced, we still have to acknowledge their, um, we must acknowledge their contribution to where we stand and who we are today. And so that's why we're called to this work as a Catholic school. And, and I, I, I want you to know this as well, that a lot of schools that have been doing this lately are universities and higher education. So it is, it is phenomenal that Visitation Georgetown is doing this work as a high school, a secondary ed education space. So that dictates some of the way that we move and also dictates um, how, what kinds of things we can do in, in this situation given our resources and given um, the call, but we are not afraid to step into the work. Uh, and it has been painful, but it has also been um, rewarding in the sense that to be able to acknowledge those people who helped build the chapel, who helped build the buildings that you went to sat in those desks and looked around and to, to acknowledge their contribution is, is honorable. So that, that's, that's kind of, um, I imagine that Barbara says, I am the heart. <laughs> so I'm gonna pass it over to Kristen, who is the head of why we do this work. <laughs> I do have a heart too, you know. Uh, you do, you do, you do. <laughs> and I do have a head. You but... do have a head. <laughs> we have, we're like a yin and a yang. Um, so whereas Daniel brings the, the gift of, of the faith perspective to this work um, it, it bring, brings that forward. I come from a more secular lens, but have been um, graciously adopted into the visitation family. And I, I appreciate that. And um, I have to say, I was hesitant at first, you know, thinking about capital C Catholic church, right? And what this means um, and to, uh, for the Catholic church at large, but then to see the dedication of um a female-led institution in this work um and the values with which everybody comes to the work um so neatly aligned with mine as a sort of secular per, you know professional in this work and coming from the museum and public history field so that has been a a really wonderful welcoming um embrace uh, to, I feel like I can embrace visitation family and I feel it embraced likewise in return. Um, as Daniel mentioned, it, it has been challenging over the last year. It's all, if the work is not challenging, then I don't think you're doing it right. <laughs> so uh, that idea of holding the discomfort um, and working towards um, uh, being, um, uh, comprehensive and conscientious in the work and to uh, be able to hold the compassion and understanding for yourself and for others. And that's why we are doing a lot of internal work over these last few years that there hasn't been a lot of public facing um, big events or, uh, you know, re press releases and that sort of thing, because I come, I believe in this work and I know others at Visitation do too, is that if we can't do our own work, there's no way we can help others in doing theirs. So seeing the commitment of the faculty and of the staff, and I have to say, in addition to working with the faculty and the staff, it has been such a pleasure to work with the students. It, to see the commitment and the passion that today's young women have for this social justice work, um, both in inside the Catholic community and outside the Catholic community has been just a blessing and inspiring. And also with the alumni who are committed to making visitation a more welcoming and just place for future generations of women uh, it's just been great. It has been the, in addition to the challenging um, emotional aspect of the work, this past year has been challenging with the COVID pandemic and returning to school and all of the pressures being put on both the faculty and the students. So our progress wasn't as great as we had hoped. Uh, we always have greater ambitions than I think the Lord allows us to, you know, oh, you can't move that fast. You, you, know, you, gotta, you gotta learn, you gotta be balanced in your life. And so thinking about how we 
parse it out and uh, value the small successes as we move. Um, and I feel like we have a, a, a solid plan moving forward and Danielle and I will be on campus in June to spend um, a couple of days with the, the freshman faculty and really committing to establishing a plan for moving forward next year and how we can incorporate this work into freshmen while encouraging the upper class faculty to experiment and do uh, you know small things as a way to work across the disciplines and incorporating this both this content but also the social justice aspect of the work so that's been that's going to be a really special time to be together and um, I'm just so excited and honored to work with this wonderful group of women and men um, who, who are here at Visitation. So, um, Danielle, I believe you're going to lead us in a, a conversation. Yeah, so we have been talking um, at you for uh, quite a while. And so now, and we've given you a lot of information. And so we want to engage as many people as possible in the work, as many of our stakeholders, as many of the community as so this isn't just something that's happening on campus, but all you know, as our, our alum, our board, all the all, everyone is kind of speaking to this work that we're engaged in. And so we'd like to hear from you using the chat. Um, if you want to just share some, some initial thoughts that you have what's on your mind and your heart as you as you hear this presentation, um, what's resonating if you have any questions about the work that's going on um, and maybe where do you see the alum helping in putting um, and, and moving this work forward uh, for the school. So we're opening the chat. Uh, Kristen and I are moderating it. So just go ahead and start sharing some things. As we're waiting, I, I'll just give you this other story to how this work is continuing. So as I said, I, I'm from Visitation St. Louis um, and Visitation St. Louis was founded in 1833. Uh, specifically, sisters from Georgetown Viz traveled to Kaskaskia, Illinois. So if they traveled in 1833 um, to another uh, area that was um, you know, allowing for the enslaved people and people to be, you know, half slaves. So uh, when I started looking at this work from in St. Louis, I said, we probably need to look at our own history as well to see how that carried on. And, you know, I, I, the, the sister said, well, you know, if we look at our history, it looks like we didn't, we just had a lot of indentured servants, or we just had a lot of, um, we, we just, we borrowed, or we didn't have any. And and so I, I just share that story to say that this is difficult work. It is challenging. It is hard to reconcile um, what we know, what we love about visitation to this other part of the history um, and what we were taught. And, and seemingly it's so different than what happened. Um, so just to say that if, if you're feeling all these other kinds of like, I don't, I don't understand, or I'm confused, or I'm angry, or that's okay, because it, it's hard to, to put the two together. But as we continue to walk forward in this journey, hopefully we'll be able to kind of bring that together. And as um, Barbara said in the beginning, as Cardinal Gregory says, we can't change history if we don't look at it. So we need to look at it to make sure that we don't continue to do those same things. So Danielle, there's the first question in this chat from Linda. Do you see the work you are doing leading to a framework for discussion and joint work with other initiatives on reparations? Um, yes, I do. But I, I want to say that, you know, again, I, I think if we look at what reparations, um, there's, there's a whole kind of uh, vision around reparations. Yes, cool kind of conversation. Um, 
that talks about money and talks about like that financial and, and contacting uh, descendants that are alive now of those and how do we engage in that um, to other kinds of forms of reparation. And so I definitely believe that the work of reparations is um, important. I want to say that we want to be very careful about how we go about doing that so that it's not something that we as an institution say, we make a decision about something and then say, this is what we're doing without hearing voices, without hearing other um, responses from other parties and, and, and what that looks like. Because uh, I think that's really important. I think, and I think if you kind of look outside what's been going on lately, you'll see that some, some institutions have moved forward with some kinds of reparations without having that conversation and have really alienated uh, descendants. So we really want to make sure that internally we are good to, that we are good and standing where we are um, and then open up conversation. Um, but again, I also want to say this, as a secondary ed school, our main focus is teaching and, and, import, and um, giving information to those young women who leave to change, to be able to transform the world, right? And so it's a little bit different. Um, so our, our, that's the way I think that we can really contribute to the, how we change what's happening in the world today by making sure that we impact those current students and those students that will be coming to make sure that they have a full grasp of understanding the history and how we don't want to repeat it and what they can do to change it so that the world is transformed. So th that's a different kind of focus for us as a secondary ed school that is really important that we need to hang on to. And I would compliment what Danielle said by thinking one of the ways I think about it is that the root word of reparations is repair. And we as Georgetown Visitation have to repair ourselves before we can help and make reparations with the larger community. So that is the, the, the phase of the process that, that we're in right now. So um, to... <laughs> oh, sorry, I was gonna address Monica's question next, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, so Monica, we are right now in the process of uh, looking at how to incorporate that full history um, and we are blessed with that rich story of the um, of the Tillmans, and um, I, I'm going to in a moment tap uh, uh, history um, teacher Will Farquhar to join me in responding to this. Uh, but um, prior to, to to engaging Will, I just wanted to say that the the school is um, uh, focusing its uh, curriculum on three themes: Who am I? Who am I in relationship to others? and what am I called to do? And so we're going to be able to incorporate that lar larger history of both enslavement at visitation and enslavement in the, in, in the global world um, through those themes of looking at who, who am I being both, me, you know, me as a student and as an individual, but also who is a person, um, who am I, who is the person in relation to others, and then what am I called to do? So what is the person's agency um, or lack of agency in the world and how can, um, well, I as a student change the world, but how do others change the world? So we're incorporating those individual stories into those larger themes. Um, but Will, since you did um, volunteer uh, in a direct chat to me to respond to that, I'd like to tap you. So come on in, Will. <laughs> I, I did. Um, and uh, I just wanted to uh, say, uh, what we do in the 11th grade U.S. history and AP U.S. history. Um, there are three basic periods where slavery dominated, the colonial period, the federal period, the antebellum period. We introduce specific anecdotes and now individuals from Vizzy's history of enslavement into them, frankly, uh, to some degree in terms of teaching compassion, and they're also effective teaching tools. Uh, to teach manumission, you can look at the manumission papers. To teach compensated emancipation, you can look at the specific busy papers. Um, uh, we don't have that much on these individuals after their work at Vizzy, we do refer to them a little bit when we talk about what happens to these enslaved people after the Civil War. 
But uh, that's the main thing we use. We bring them in specifically to our history in a way that, frankly, we weren't even doing five years ago. Thank you, Will. There's a rich archive of um, documents that are uh, digitized and currently accessible on the visitation's website. And there is a, a sizable portion of historic documents that have yet to be processed or but are in process um, uh, with, a current, with a historian that's under contract to visitation at the moment. And then there's an entire world of archives that have yet to be explored. So as these documents are uncovered, we're working with the Salesian Center and the school archivist and the historian who's been contracted to keep pulling those items out to transcribing them to, uh, we will continue to work with the faculty to figure out how, as Will said, to, to, to slot those documents in and use the story of, uh, of those at visitation to illustrate larger themes in US and world history. And I, I mean, honestly, if we say, if we look at the current, the work that has been done, if you go to that, if you go to the website and see it's it's incredible, but it's probably not user friendly to, to be able to look through all of the, the, the documents. So in our transparency, it is, it's all there, but it is a little, it's difficult to manage. So there was a question about, had we had, have we had descendants contact us or had we made any contact with uh, descendants? And I would say not yet because part of, partly we're still looking at the internal, but partly also we wanna make sure that that information is out there so that descendants who are doing their own kind of research might be able to navigate that information in a way that's user friendly, um, so that then we, then we'll be able to build on that relationship. Um, so we want to make sure that we can get that information out in a way that's um, to be able to be processed, um, and then so we're not shying away from speaking to descendants. It's just we've got we've got our priorities kind of set in different ways right now. And I would speak to that idea of digitizing and making accessible the collections in that the process of genealogical research for those in the um, African American community is very difficult. Um, and we talk about hitting the 1865 wall um, where, where documents um, prior to that have few names and it, uh, those sorts of things. So the more collections we can uncover and digitize and make accessible to the school primarily, but then secondarily to the wider Catholic community and then everybody else. So those doing genealogical research, research on the history of enslavement in Washington, DC, of history of enslavement in the Catholic church, um, those stories are, those individual stories are, are, are uncovered and those, those, those names and those ancestral connections can be recovered. And that story, all of those stories can be linked together into a larger history of our country. And, 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 and just to follow up on that a little bit, like, so the, the way that that research happens, it's, it's, it's not a, it's not like one folder, let's say in the mm. archives, that says those that were enslaved, right? It, it, it you have, we have to look at um, different avenues to get that information. So we're looking at baptismal records. We're looking at, you know, sacramental records. We are looking at, um, you know, under products or things that, that we own or, so it, 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 just the way that the information is kind of shared throughout the archives requires um, much more like intentional following the, the dots. Um, they're just kind of picking up a folder that, oh, this was all the, this was all our, you know, enslaved people. It's not, it's certainly not like that at all. Um, so we have to, uh, so it, it really does take an expertise to kind of to, pil to, to kind of go through those and, and set it in such a way to help families. And then, you know, as I did the work for the Slavery History Memory and Reconciliation Project, I will say in the beginning, we didn't think we were gonna find, we would be able to find many descendants because as Chris, uh, Kristen talked about that wall, you know, after a certain time, are we gonna be able to track, um, you know, the history to find that genealogy? And, 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 and yes, we can, but it does take a lot more um, intentional focus on what parts do we look for, um, look at. It can't just be kind of getting on, um, you know, ancestry.com 
although that it's it's getting better but to a certain extent after a while it stops and so now you have to start doing some other research i put the link to the specific web page on the station's um, site so that um, you could after we're done um go and, and and walk through some of these documents and and sort of understand what maybe a little bit better what danielle was talking about and that you these tiny scraps of paper that are you know in ledger books and looking through ledger books and you might just see a line that says you know negro woman or negro woman nancy or something to that effect and each of those mentions has to be cataloged and organized and um it's a, a, it's a process other thoughts or questions and to and please know that if you if you um something comes up later feel free and I'm, we're gonna probably switch this over to Susie in a minute but feel free to contact her and just say hey th I, this I've been thinking about this and she will get it to the committee um and we will we will definitely honor that and listen to that your concerns or things Um, I think I want to just say thank you um, to everyone who's shared what is um, in your hearts and minds about this important, difficult, and sacred work. Um, please know that I am extremely interested in engaging with alumni about this work, not just during reunion weekend, but throughout the year. So if you have insights or you want to tell me what you're feeling about this, um, answer any questions, as Danielle said, I can also pass this to our, to the appropriate person to answer your questions. I've been completely privileged to engage in this work um, with our consultants and to be part of the HEP Alumni Scope and Sequence Advisory Committee and to see some of the same themes and intersections of this work being woven into the work of our other alumni board committees, particularly the Alumni Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee. Um, and I promise I will strive to represent alumni interests throughout my service on the HEP steering committee. So please share with me um, what you're thinking. Um, at this moment, uh, we would like you to um, take a few moments to sit in silence and reflect as Sister Berkman's reads the names of the individuals who were enslaved here at Georgetown Visitation Convent. And at the conclusion of this reflection, Danielle will kindly offer us a closing song. We at Georgetown Visitation will always have a deeply personal connection to the quest for racial justice in our country today. Our hearts are heavy as we acknowledge the sad and painful reality that our early sisters were involved in the enslavement of men, women, and children. As we pray in our direction of intention, we promise to accept for love of you all the difficulty that we shall meet. We realize our history of enslavement is our cross to carry, but with God's mercy and strength, we strive to carry it as truth seekers, justice sowers, and Christ bearers. Our present call and responsibility is to fully understand the legacy of slavery, reflected in the pernicious racism that endures today, and to work toward justice in our world. We honor all our brothers and sisters who in voluntary sacrifices supported the mission and growth of this school. We honor those whose presence was never acknowledged. We speak their names, or we speak the sparse details of those whose identity we have discovered in census reports and other public records and whose individual names we do not know. It is by name 
that each one of us has been called by God. It is our names and the names of those who were enslaved here that are inscribed on the heart of Jesus. And it is God who hears our prayers. May the wisdom and power of God assist us in our quest to erase racism in our country today. Today we remember unnamed person, unnamed man, George, Stacy, George, George's wife, George's child, George's second child, Maki, Maki's child, Maki's second child, Spencer's, Michael, Charles, unnamed boy, unnamed young man, unnamed man, unnamed mature man, unnamed mature man, unnamed girl, unnamed girl, unnamed woman, unnamed mature woman, unnamed mature woman, unnamed mature woman, unnamed mature woman, an old woman, Millie, Millie's child, Millie's second child, Nas, Charles, Monica, Mary, Eliza, Leon, Ned, Minty, Minty's child, Minty's second child, unnamed man, Ross, Betty, Cletus, George, unnamed child, Harriet, Prudence, Prudence child, Ruth, Eliza, Stacy, unnamed boy, unnamed girl, unnamed child, Edward Shorter, Nellie, Susan, Susan's child, Susan's second child, Susan's third child, unnamed man, unnamed man, unnamed mature man, unnamed man, unnamed young woman, unnamed young woman, unnamed woman, unnamed woman, unnamed woman, unnamed woman. Joe, Joe's wife, Joe's child, Joe's second child, Sophia, Fanny, Fanny's child, Fanny's second child, Robert, unnamed girl, unnamed young woman, unnamed man, Stephen Dixon, Stephen, Eliza, unnamed boy, Anne Dixon, unnamed young man, Charlotte Mahorny, Elizabeth Weldon, Jane Mahoney, Sydney Tillman, Ignatius Tillman, Susan Tillman, Mary Elizabeth Tillman, 
Charles Tillman, Theodore Tillman, Jane Tillman, John Tillman, Cecilia Tillman, Josephine Tillman, Rosalie Tillman, Benjamin Mahoney, Thomas Weldon, Joseph Dixon, Elizabeth Mahoney, Alice Gray, Mary Jane Rudy, Mr. Williams, Miss Williams, Little Girl Dixon, Charlotte Smith, John Smith, Irene Marshall, Miss Fitzhugh, Miss Eliza Duncan, Anne Green, Miss E. D. Vaudricourt, Miss Rumont, Out of our weary years, God of our silent tears, Thou who has brought us thus far on the way, Thou who has by Thy might led us into the light. Keep us forever in the path we pray. Lest our feet stray from the places our God where we met thee. Lest our hearts Drunk with the wine of the world, we forget thee. Shadowed beneath thy hand, may we forever stand. True to our God, true to our native. Land. Thank you, Danielle. I'd like to thank um, Dr. Edmondson, Olivia Wills Kane, Kristen, and Danielle for being with us. And of course, all of you alums that are, have joined us, Will Farquhar, thank you for um, answering questions as well. Um, uh, again, this is blessed and sacred work, and we really would welcome your participation and your comments. Um, so thank you so much. Have a good rest of your afternoon and uh, happy reunion. <laughs>